Hey, I'm Miranda, and you're listening to or watching Unraveling Matters. Just to make it a little bit lighter, um, I took the kids down to Florida to go on vacation, and we're at a Disney store. And as we're perusing the Disney store, there was a, bo- a box, it's like a round, clear container of like the princesses. So one of them, and there was two, one had Aurora, from Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, Ariel, and then the other white princesses, and a complete separate package of just all the minority princesses. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> Pocahontas. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then you have your other princesses. And it was such a deep moment. Like, one, it just struck me. And I wondered if the kids noticed that the dolls were segregated. And I asked, like, do you notice anything about this packaging right here? And the kids are like, well, ah, they're just princesses in a box mm-hmm. thingy. But it's the subtle messages. Yes. So mm-hmm. That is evident everywhere. I have found dolls, same doll. White doll be 25 bucks. The black doll be 20 bucks. Difference in pricing. Mm-hmm. And it's throughout all the kids sections. If you really just pay attention to the toys, pricing, how they're arranged, where things are located, you'll see that the bias just permeates everything. And it may not seem like a big deal, but when these messages are reinforced, reinforced, it's water over stone. And it shapes the way the kids see the world when you're otherized, Mm -hmm. even in the toy section. Uh But that makes me want to ask you, what is a better approach to teaching children about race and racism? Thinking about just the very basics of how a little person's mind grows and develops, one of the big pieces of a child's development is forming and creating different categories through which they can understand the world. And one of the big kind of developmental terms that you'll hear used is just this idea of assimilation versus accommodation when you're encountering and learning new information. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important when we get into the discussions of how we see different people and how we view the world. Assimilation is essentially the idea that when you encounter a new piece of information, you're going to try to fit it into a category that you already have in your mind. That's the easiest thing for your brain to do. If we had to stop and categorize every single thing every time, we would never get anything done. So a great example of this you'll often hear in really young children is uh, taking a piece of new information and then trying to fit it into a category in a way that doesn't work. So you might see a child who has a pet dog at home and sees that dog every day and cuddles with that dog. You might see them when they encounter a different animal, like a horse, you might see them call that horse a dog. Yeah. That horse is obviously not a dog. And most likely as a parent, you're probably going to talk with that child about, okay, well, so this animal is actually called a horse and you know, they're bigger than the dog. They have a longer tail than the dog. You're gonna talk about some of those differences so that they can then grow and develop a, an entirely new box to put that horse in. Otherwise, they're going to shuffle it into that dog box because that's the box they already have. And so that's a really huge idea when we're talking about the idea of race because we, we do know that children do see color. Um, very young children see that people look different um, mm-hmm. from each other, from them. As we're helping them develop these different boxes to accommodate that information, we also want to be really involved in shaping what information does and does not go in those boxes. Because there's a lot of information that's going to get filtered in from the messages they get from media, from their experiences walking around in the world. Um, But as parents, as caregivers, we have the opportunity to shape those boxes and help them to create good and healthy and strong boxes that are going to help them to learn to navigate the world in a different way. That's just a huge kind of developmental process that we need to keep in mind as we're thinking about how do we teach, how do we shape our children's view and understanding. That is very, very helpful. I hadn't even thought about that. Because it makes me wonder if we don't discuss how children think about race and racism, what are they going to intuitively decide Uh for themselves? Absolutely. I I remember the first time my godson, my godson's only ever seen myself and my kids. He's never seen my kid's father. Mm -hmm. And my godson is Irish and my kids are tan. And first time he saw their dad, he's like, that's not their dad. Why can't he be their dad? Oh, because he's not brown like you. 
So how can yeah. like you can't do it that way? <laughs> and after that, I had proactive discussions with my godchild about race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great example of that. One of the history pieces I also wanted to bring into this discussion was just this idea of haven't we, you know, come so far in the idea of how we think about race. And, and one of the areas where we clearly haven't come very far um, is the impact of all the societal messages on how children understand and experience um, race and all the dynamics that go along with that. So if we go back to the 1940s, there were two psychologists, um, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, who did this kind of groundbreaking research that are kind of colloquially referred to as the doll experiments. Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, well, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because, he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Yeah, which one looks like? And that one. Okay. And we see this kind of idealization of this white baby doll, right? That one's pretty because it has white skin, it has blue eyes. It really kind of just reinforces the idea that these are young children, these are two to four year olds that are talking about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'd like to say, okay, we, we've come so far in those messages, but you can literally go on YouTube today and see videos of these experiments that are still filmed and the messages that these children are talking about are, they're still pretty much the same as they were in the 1940s. It's just a testament to how much these categories are going to be shaped and how much work we have to do to shape them in a really healthy way um, because the default category is not gonna be something that's very healthy. So going off of what Catherine said, if we don't intentionally actually talk about race, by the time kids get to preteens or the age that I work with, they've already internalized all of these messages. They've already decided, okay, this is who mom tells me I'm supposed to be. This is who the community, my family tells me who I'm supposed to be. This is how I'm supposed to act. They've internalized all of it. And that learning comes from their own experiences. So by the time I get them, they're like, wow, I'm in this identity stage. I'm going to decide who I'm supposed to be by looking at my peer groups. Because at that point in time and at teenage years, they're looking beyond the family. They're looking beyond their parents. They're trying to get a sense of who they are with their group of friends. So they're going to go out there with these internalized messages, thinking that's who they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to be treated. There's no protection, in my opinion. I've seen so many youth who don't even realize some of the trauma and the hurt that they have and that devaluing of self comes from just not even understanding their own experiences, their own historic experiences, which is kind of damaging. And when you're trying to develop a very strong and positive identity, because then who are you? The world tells me I'm supposed to be this, but I have this dream and everybody's messaging to me that I'm not going to be able to reach that. We, when you were just talking about that, the kids wouldn't necessarily naturally bring it up. If you're being treated in alignment with what you've been taught, there's no space for you to say, hey, this is not okay with me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for watching. I sincerely hope that you found this conversation helpful. And if you did, please consider liking and subscribing so that you can hear the next part in this series where we discuss how to talk to children about race and ethnicity.